Las Vegas has become full of ginormous, luxurious, and ostentatious hotels and resorts. But at one point, the Strip was headed down a sharp decline as rivals stole tourists and developers built renowned venues elsewhere. That's when casino developer Steve Wynn decided to do something that Las Vegas had never seen before and build a mega resort he called the Mirage, an oasis in the Nevada desert. The transformative venue became the crown jewel of Las Vegas and enjoyed great fortune and fame. But as even larger and more luxurious resorts hit the Strip, the Mirage soon fell behind and questions arose about the property's ability to compete. Join me as we learn the history behind the groundbreaking hotel and casino, why it was so revolutionary, and what's in store for its future. My name is Lee Brees, and this is Modern Ruins, Episode 16. While Las Vegas has always been known as the place for entertainment, the era in which the Mirage was born is completely unrecognizable to the strip it inhabits today, and the resort is largely credited with establishing the modern Las Vegas that has now outgrown the groundbreaking attraction. Retrospectively, 1931 was the beginning of the Strip and its entertainment motif. That year, the state of Nevada became the first to legalize gambling, and the United States Bureau of Reclamation began construction on the nearby Hoover Dam, bringing in more than 20,000 men to at the time was a town of only 5,000. The business opportunity that had sprung up overnight was unlike anything that's ever occurred in U.S. history, and people from all around, some with more questionable backgrounds than others, descended on the little-known Las Vegas to open theaters, hotels, restaurants, and casinos. Before construction of the dam, the city was simply a small collection of nightclubs meant to entertain people driving to and from California. One of these clubs was the single story, Red Rooster. Guests of the drive-by attraction would indulge a chicken dinner for less than a dollar and then enjoy a night full of music and dancing. It also was known as a speakeasy during the time of Prohibition between 1920 and 1933, which later became an issue. When Nevada legalized gambling in 1931, the Red Rooster became the first legal casino in Las Vegas and in turn the entire United States with just a single blackjack table and three slot machines but a casino nonetheless. Only a few months later, the FBI raided the casino under the suspicion that alcohol was being distributed and consumed there, and consequentially, the Red Rooster had its gaming license revoked, setting the president lifespan of a casino in Las Vegas to just four months. The Red Rooster was then sold to actress Grace Hayes, who wanted to get into the nightclub business, and renamed it the Grace Hayes Lodge. Not long after she purchased it, the lodge burned to the ground and had to be entirely rebuilt. The brand new club welcomed guests ranging from traditional tourists to the likes of Vegas Titans, Bugsy Siegel, and Howard Hughes. But Hayes ended up lacking confidence in her pursuit, reverting the name back to Red Rooster and selling and buying it back several times in the span of months, pulling out completely by 1953. She did, however, keep a portion of it for her personal residence, living in a house she constructed on the property until Steve Wynn approached her with plans to build the elegant and elaborate Mirage. Meanwhile, the new owners of Red Rooster and the recently constructed neighboring San Susi Motel made upgrades to evolve the properties to keep up with the evolution of the strip itself. Trying several rebrands in an attempt to make the place seem more prestigious, using names like the Hi Ho Club, the Patio Club, the Rendezvous, and lastly, reverting back to San Susi Hotel. Investor Ben Chafee then purchased the property, demolishing all structures and building a Polynesian-themed resort called Castaways. Reactions to the concept were mixed, and issues with the management structure led it to close and reopen again several times. By 1967, Chafee had had enough and sold it to businessman and innovator Howard Hughes, who at the time was embarking on a crusade to save Las Vegas from the mob, buying as many resorts as he could. That very same year, a young Yale Law School dropout by the name of Steve Wynn relocated his family from New York to Las Vegas and purchased a small portion of the Frontier Hotel and Casino. After success with his purchase, Wynn bought a controlling interest in the Golden Nugget, one of Las Vegas' oldest casinos. By 1973, he increased his stake to become the majority shareholder, becoming the youngest casino owner in town at just 31 years old. 
He then modernized the three-decade-old resort and constructed its first tower. While controversial, this led many to credit Wynn with saving the Golden Nugget from a long, drawn-out demise like the Sands and so many other of the original Las Vegas resorts suffered and turned it into the crown gem of the Strip at the time. On the other side of the country, the state of New Jersey legalized gambling in 1976, with Atlantic City and its boardwalk being the East Coast rival to Las Vegas and its Strip. Wynn sought to grow his success in this emerging casino market and purchased the Strand Motel on the boardwalk for $8.5 million and tore it down. He then constructed the 500-room Golden Nugget Atlantic City, opening in 1980 as the second smallest casino in town at the time. However, just three short years later, it became the most profitable resort on the boardwalk, with its opera house welcoming stars like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Dolly Parton, and Don Rickles. After a successful revamp in Vegas and a surprise triumph in Atlantic City, Wynn was ready to do something bigger, but like, way bigger. In 1981, Wynn announced plans for the 2,800-room Victoria Bay, which would be constructed on 45 acres next to the Silverbird Hotel in Las Vegas and consist of four 30-story towers, making it the largest hotel in the world. Wynn and his company, The Golden Nugget, then undertook feasibility studies which suggested the Victoria Bay would cost an unbelievable $400 million to build. At the time, the United States economy as a whole was still recovering from a steep recession, and the economic models produced by Golden Nugget showed the project wasn't going to be economically viable, and by the end of 1981, Wynn had scrapped the project. With the economy and Wynn's lofty ambitions not completely lining up, he was going to have to either settle for a lesser resort or wait until things got better. Like any good business person, however, he made sure he had options. While shopping for sites to build his colossal Victoria Bay, he came across the now decrepit 27-acre property occupied by castaways and actress Grace Hayes. Since Wynn was just exploring sites to put his ginormous resort, he initially bought a land option from the late Howard Hughes's Summa Corporation, which he let lapse when other properties became available. But after striking out and mulling his options, he went back, this time with serious intentions to purchase the smaller castaway site, and the deal was closed in 1986. The economy at this point was in much better shape, but Wynn still needed the funds to build his new resort. While risky or not, he decided to sell the Golden Nugget Atlantic City and use the proceeds to pay for construction, securing $440 million in cash from the sale. 90-year-old actress Grace Hayes then agreed to sell Wynn the house she had lived in the majority of her life, and once all structures were cleared, construction on the groundbreaking project would commence. At this point, the Victoria Bay concept had long been forgotten, and Wynn was more focused on building something that Las Vegas had never seen before, rather than just building something bigger, but still fully intended to do both. Legendary casino architect Joel Berkman, who worked for Wynn full-time in his design firm, among others, came up with the concept and design of the new resort. The final design plan centered around a South Seas and Polynesian theme and was partially inspired by the 1958 film South Pacific. Ten acres of landscaped lawns and pools would surround the main structure, and out front, guests would be lured in by an erupting volcano, several waterfalls, and a plethora of exotic plant life. Regarding the resort concept, when said, quote, Think of the harsh southern Nevada desert, and then you see a waterfall, something out of the South Pacific or the island of Kauai. It's not supposed to be there, and that was the intention, to create a mirage. The hotel portion of the resort would be unprecedented in Las Vegas. The innovative and later highly replicated Y-shaped tower design stood 29 stories tall, containing over 3,000 rooms, making the new resort the third largest hotel in the world and the second largest on the Strip. The top five floors would be reserved for high rollers and penthouse suites, distinguished by uninterrupted glass panes and 18-karat gold windows. Upon entering, guests would walk through a lush jungle display beneath a domed atrium, and the lobby would be fully surrounded by a $1.2 million aquarium full of hundreds of exotic fish. Five restaurants and several nightclubs would serve as the venue's built-in entertainment, and architects would design them to only need one kitchen to serve all the restaurants in order to reduce 
costs. 300,000 square feet of convention space would allow for various trade shows and conventions to be regularly held at the resort, in addition to hosting residences for musical artists and other entertainers. Gaming area totaled over 90,000 square feet, with 2,300 slot machines and 115 table games. The convention center and other attractions were very important to win, as unlike most resorts, he wanted the property to be unreliant on the casino for the majority of its income. When the project was announced, it was originally called the Golden Nugget, a duplicate of Wynn's renowned resort. However, this was just a temporary name until a final branding strategy could be determined. Ground was broken for the new resort in November 1987, and construction would last for two years. One year in, the Golden Nugget announced the name would be The Mirage to fit in line with Wynn's vision of an oasis in the Nevada desert. Marcor Development Company and Sierra Construction Corporation served as contractors for the project, with preliminary price estimates saying the total cost of construction would be over $550 million. The Mirage topped out well over budget. At $630 million, it became the most expensive hotel and casino ever built. But with would be surpassed by construction of the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City just a few months later. The grand opening was originally scheduled for the day after Christmas 1989, but after the announcement that Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran III were going to fight for the WBC super middleweight title, Wynn quickly swooped in and secured the new resort as their venue and moved the official grand opening up to December 7th at 12 p.m. The Mega Resort on the Las Vegas Strip opened to tremendous excitement and high expectations. A full crowd filled the casino and nearly all strip foot traffic was drawn into the Mirage's exotic volcano and water features. Before the first hour was out, someone had already hit a $4.6 million jackpot on a $1 slot machine, and the new venue now had become part of the history of the Las Vegas Strip. The fight took place that night in what proved to be a lopsided matchup. Leonard and Durand only had a one and a half pound difference, but were separated by one and a half inches in height and five years of age, all contributing to a 12 round victory for Sugar Ray. The Mirage was the first resort to open on the Strip in 16 years, and its anticipation was unmatched. Since the rise of Atlantic City on the East Coast, tourism to Las Vegas had sharply declined, so the Strip had been longing for someone to build something that would revitalize it. The new venue proved a great success. The idea of a mega resort with multiple attractions outside of a casino proved so revolutionary and transformative that it spawned a building boom of new resorts and casinos throughout the 1990s and early 2000s. With venues that helped build Las Vegas, like the sands across the street, being erased and replaced by even more luxurious projects than the Mirage. Financiers and gaming executives estimated that the mega resort would have to earn over a million dollars per day to break even on expenses, which proved too easy a task for Steve Wynn's masterpiece, and in turn, up the ante. Despite the immense cost to construct the Mirage, its success largely surpassed expectations, and Wynn believed the resort could be even better, and only a year in, he announced a $100 million expansion that included additional amenities and attractions. A $14 million dolphin habitat would be created behind the resort. Four separate pools featuring five dolphins would serve as an education and research center, while also entertaining guests of a variety of ages, and locally became a popular field trip destination. When planning the expansion project, Wynn teamed up with Michael Jackson to design a new mountain and water attraction to the zoo area. The concept the two came up with resembled Diamond Head in Hawaii and featured pools, a water slide, and even more high roller villas. The project was estimated to cost $15 million and was scheduled to open later in 1990, but final construction plans were never made. This wasn't the only connection the King of Pop had to the resort, as witnesses claim he stayed in a villa there while filming his music video for One More Chance in 2003, which is when Jackson's Neverland Ranch was raided by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department. However, I wasn't able to find any evidence to validate this claim, nor the rumor that Jackson trashed his room after finding out about the raid. Going into the 1990 expansion, illusionist Siegfried and Roy signed a $58 million contract with the Mirage and were to serve as the resort's main source of entertainment, holding their first performance on February 1st, 1990. 
Their show was housed in the theater Mirage, which could hold 1,500 spectators, and featured a magic show of a variety of tricks, starring the duo of Siegfried Fischbacher and Roy Horn, and circus animals, namely white tigers. The pair and their menagerie proved so popular that a statue of them would be erected outside the hotel, and they are credited with increasing the popularity of not just the Mirage, but Las Vegas as a whole, and helped make it seem more like a family-friendly tourist destination. Playing off their success, managed managers added a two and a half acre, $15 million exhibit for the tigers, but also would add lions, snow leopards, panthers, and an Asian elephant. The exhibit would be called the Secret Garden of Siegfried and Roy, and in 2002 would be combined with the dolphin exhibit for a total 10-acre attraction that brought in half a million guests annually. When did another expansion in the late 90s, spending $150 million on artwork in the casino and another $100 million on the creation of two additional theater venues? These allowed for so many other iconic Las Vegas acts to play the Mirage, with Terry Fader operating a popular puppet show in one of the theaters for more than a decade. Throughout the 1990s, boxing would also be a regular source of live entertainment. Buster Douglas and Evander Holyfield competed for the heavyweight championship in 1990, with Holyfield knocking out the out-of-shape Douglas in the third round in what was a disappointing fight, among half a dozen other noteworthy contests. Cirque de Soleil began playing the resort in 1992, hosting shows in a 1,300-seat, $5 million temporary tent behind the hotel. By this point, the Mirage had become the most talked about resort in Vegas, and at only eight years old, it was the most profitable on the Strip. Tourism to the area had rebounded, and everyone who came to town wanted to stay there. Steve Wynn was so proud of his achievement that he renamed the parent company that owned his casino resorts from Golden Nugget to Mirage Resorts in 1991. The property became featured in both commercial successes and commercial flops in pop culture across the board, from video games to TV shows and movies in response to its popularity. The movie Sergeant Bilko, starring Steve Martin, filmed scenes in the casino while the entire resort was the centerpiece of the underwhelming Vegas vacation film. The Griswolds would stay at the Mirage during their family vacation to Las Vegas, and each member of the family would have their own crazy separate adventures before coming back together at the end of the film. Wynn actually permitted portions of the resort to be closed during filming, which was quite a surprise, and it was just unfortunate that the film had a disappointing run at the box office. Like any good entrepreneur, Steve Wynn was already thinking about what was coming next. He had built the Mirage into the most successful business venture in Vegas, and he didn't hesitate to try to recreate his success and grow his business interests beyond it. When opened, the 450 million, 2900 room, family centered Treasure Island Hotel and Casino in one of the Mirage's old parking lots in 1993. This resort had a pirate theme and was compatible to the tropical theme of the Mirage. Wynn originally wanted to add another tower to the resort, but later opted to build a separate development entirely and connect the two by tram. Next, he built the 1.6 billion 3900 room Bellagio, which was more opulent and luxurious than the Mirage or Treasure Island, and became the new king of the Strip. However, revenue in its first year was less than expected, and investors overall were disappointed early on with its performance under Wynn's leadership. He then tried an experimental project in Biloxi, Mississippi, where the state was trying to build their own Las Vegas slash Atlantic City, opening a casino resort there under the name Beau Rivage. This project also proved to be a flop early on. Both the Bellagio and Beau Rivage projects lacked the opening success the Mirage had, and institutional investors began to question the company's viability on its own with limited assets, and Steve Wynn at the helm. Seeing an opportunity, fellow casino resort owner Kirk Kerkorian cold-called Wynn, offering $17 per share to purchase Mirage Resorts and combine it with his company, MGM Grand. Wynn, as predicted, refused the offer, but investors then pressured him into reconsidering. The next day, he called Kerkorian back, and the two agreed on a $21 per share selling price. The total sale of Mirage Resorts to MGM Grand amounted to $6.4 billion, with $4.4 billion paid in cash. And after the deal closed in May 2000, the new combined company, now called MGM Mirage, took immediate control over all of Wynn's assets, including the Golden Nugget, the Bellagio, Treasure Island, and the Mirage. And Steve Wynn took the cash and pursued new projects.
MGM then undertook a massive renovation of the only 11-year-old resort, whose hotel rooms had already been redone once. Rooms were completed in 2002 with major renovations to other portions of the building occurring in 2005 to 2006, followed up by a $100 million renovation to the casino and restaurants in 2008, and its tropical theme was largely scaled back. The renovation added several nightclubs to the resort as they were becoming a common and popular feature in the new hotel and casinos. The new topless bar and lounge became a popular attraction to locals and celebrities, with Fergie and Quentin Tarantino making great use of it and the Jet Nightclub when they hosted a joint birthday party at the Mirage in 2008. The five main restaurants were also constantly changing and were upgraded throughout the various renovations, as they were frequently operated by celebrity chefs. Siegfried and Roy survived all the renovations and ownership changes and were still a huge draw to Vegas. However, their success wouldn't last much longer. In 2003, member of the duo Roy Horn appeared to be struggling during an October show. Then, one of their tigers bit him in the neck and dragged him off stage. While fault was quickly given to the white tiger, Manticore, Roy said later that he suffered a stroke during the performance and believed Manticore was actually dragging him off stage to get him help, grabbing him like one of their cubs. Horn was partially paralyzed from the stroke, and just a few days later, the Mirage announced that the iconic show was permanently canceled. This loss drastically sunk profits for the resort the following year, and managers scrambled to find a new show to draw people to the Mirage. In August 2004, they announced that the duo's former theater would be gutted to make way for a $100 million 2,000-seat venue, which would feature a Beatles-themed Cirque du Soleil show called Love, which began playing the resort in June 2006, and the front of the main structure was given exterior styling to promote the new show. MGM also invested heavily in revamping the volcano out front, in 2008, it was stripped down to its steel frame and received an entirely new exterior shell. The $15 million upgrade resulted in a volcano that could produce 12-foot-high eruptions, and 120 flamethrowers were added to the surrounding pool to shoot flames out of the lagoon during eruptions. By the 2010s, the Mirage was now 20 years old, which in a constantly evolving industry was becoming ancient. Despite this, the resort was still incredibly popular and very competitive to its newer counterparts. Upgrades were now limited to only restaurant name changes or new acts taking residence in its theaters. Okay, now, the Mirage was about to enter a rather complicated process of ownership and lease transfers. It takes a little bit of focus to follow along with what's going on, but you just need to remember, the resort has one entity that owns it, and a separate one that operates it, and either are able to be changed at any time without impact to the other. In 2016, MGM Mirage transferred ownership of the resort along with many of its properties to a realty trust called MGM Growth Properties, leasing it to MGM Resorts International, who would serve as the property management company and own the majority stake in the realty trust. Sounds backwards, I know. By creating a realty trust for their properties while keeping everything else separate, they were able to use their assets to raise cash, issuing an initial public offering on April 25, 2016, and raising over a billion dollars while MGM still retained 76% ownership of its properties in the trust. By 2021, MGM Growth Properties and MGM Resorts collectively owned and operated many different properties and were looking to add new ones. MGM was also at a point where they were debating whether they really wanted to be both a property owner and a manager. After all, if a development goes south or starts to decline, not only are you left with a depreciating asset, but that also hurts the company that manages it, which in this case was so technically MGM, resulting in being double exposed in the case of a downturn. They had already spun off their real estate holdings into a separate company, and so selling off those holdings was the next logical step. In August 2021, Beachy Properties, who owned dozens of resorts and casinos across the country and on the Strip, agreed to acquire MGM Growth Properties for $17.2 billion. MGM had actually offered to buy Vici back in 2018 for $6 billion, but Vici's board rejected it and decided instead to issue a public offering. After the deal closed in 2022, with the addition of 15 MGM properties including the Mirage, Vici's valuation was now over $45 billion and became the largest landowner in Las Vegas at a total of 660 acres owned on the Strip. 
A few years earlier, Hard Rock International, a Florida-based and Indian tribe-owned hospitality company, was looking to build or buy a property on the Las Vegas Strip to serve as their new flagship venue. After selling the original Hard Rock Hotel in Las Vegas to Virgin Hotels, they had already been on a sprint to open new properties, as in just a two-year span, they opened casinos in Sacramento, California, Gary, Indiana, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. With MGM Resorts International focusing on securing contracts to operate newer venues and less focused on maintaining old ones, CEO William Hornbuckle said the Mirage quote, just fell pretty far down in the spectrum of how much in capital we'd allocate to it in any given period of time in the near future. As a result, in conjunction with the sale of MGM Growth Properties to Vici Properties, MGM Resorts International would also sell the triple lease agreement that it had on the Mirage to Hard Rock International. The sale of the resort wouldn't close until sometime in 2022, but the sale agreement between Hard Rock and MGM was finalized in December 2021, with the Seminole Tribe paying MGM over a billion dollars for the contract. While final details about renovation plans under the new agreement have not been released, rumors about what will happen to the Mirage have been abundant. First off, the name is likely to be removed and the resort will become known as the Hard Rock Las Vegas. Hotel rooms and suites will be entirely gutted and renovated for what must be the thousandth time. And the rest of the resort will likely receive an overhaul as well and be adorned with Hard Rock's heavy emphasis on music and memorabilia, with Hard Rock saying the property will open as an essentially new resort. NGM agreed to lease the Mirage name to Hard Rock royalty-free for three years, while the new lease owners determine how exactly they want to rebrand the property. The Love Show had its contract extended through the end of 2023, but it's not expected to be renewed. Hard Rock released renderings at the same time the sale was announced of an early proposal for exterior styling post-rebrand, and company executives later confirmed it planned to demolish the iconic volcano and construct a guitar-shaped hotel, similar to the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida. Vegas residents and longtime fans of the Strip were enraged by the idea of removing the iconic volcano, with a Las Vegas historian at UNLV saying the volcano and Las Vegas is synonymous to the Statue of Liberty and New York City. A petition was then created on Change.org to save the volcano, and as of October 2022, the measure has over 8,000 signatures. As previously stated, no firm final plans have been announced, and what has been stated here is subject to change. Right now, no one knows when final plans will be released or when the Mirage will close for renovation, but Hard Rock has stated they would like to open the Hard Rock Las Vegas in 2025. Regardless of the resort's future, it took the Mirage less than a year to transform the Strip and become sewn deep into the fabric of the history of Las Vegas. Tourism to the area had been declining, and competitors across the country and the globe were opening new and innovative venues while Vegas couldn't get over the Rat Pack days. Steve Wynn's unrelenting drive to bring his vision of something that had never been done before to Las Vegas changed not just the Strip forever, but hospitality as a whole. And you have to wonder what the two would look like today had Wynn given up on Victoria Bay. I know it's sad to see the mirage change into something unrecognizable, but on behalf of all the iconic and historic resorts of Las Vegas that are no longer with us, the story of the mirage isn't over yet. And on that note, thank you for watching. Subscribe to La Brise TV for more Modern Ruins content. And be sure to comment what modern ruin you'd like us to cover next.